What's up guys? Welcome to a very special edition of A Fistful of Collars. A little bit different than usual. Of course, we're not in our usual weekly Thursday afternoon slot. It's Monday morning and we decided to get Gordon straight into the studio pretty much immediately after your big win at Kasai Super Series over Joao Gabriel. Gordon, first of all, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks so much Thank for coming you guys. in. But um, man, you kind of, uh, it was touch and go whether we thought we'd even get you in here because of what happened on Saturday night. Run us through what happened in the last 10 seconds of that first round. Uh, yeah, so in the first 10 seconds of regulation, um, or the la sorry, the last 10 seconds of regulation or so, uh, I went to elevate him into cross Hachigurami and I actually had a full figure four locked. Um, but as I went to extend my hips, my w leg was coming up and his hips were coming down. He sprawled heavy and my knee just popped like five or six times. Yikes. Um, and I was like, well, that's not good. Uh, so I, I released a figure four and then, uh, you know, time ran out and I went over to John and I was like, hey, I just barely, had, you know, injured the outside of my knee. It popped, you know, pretty bad. Um, so John's like, okay. He's like, we'll go out and just hit the guard and try to, um, try to play with that. some elevations on the opposite side. So that was the plan. So yeah, I got, uh, I got hurt pretty bad in the finals of the uh, last 10 seconds of regulation. But I would say that if for whoever watched the fight live or who has watched it since, you can't tell. I mean, you, you hit it pretty well. I, I can remember going over to your corner in between the rounds because there was the 10 minute regulation and then there was a five minute overtime, right? Yes. And I went over and I was kind of trying to see what the vibe was because I was like, man, there's something going on here, but I couldn't put my finger on it. But for me, I couldn't tell that you had injured your leg. Yeah, I mean, I just tried to uh, have a, a poker face, not because I was trying to be tough, just because I know that John teaches every day with a far more injured knee and doesn't ever complain about it. So I was like, man, I can't really, I can't bitch about this right now. <laughs> for people who don't know, Danaher has had a serious uh, knee and hip problems for probably decades now at this yeah. stage, right? Yeah, he hurt, so. his, he hurt his knee, I think, when he was like 14 or something playing rugby. Wow. And then uh, he like tore a bunch of ligaments in his knee and they tried to do a surgery to fix it, but they just messed it up and when they when they sewed him back up, they shortened all the ligaments. So now his knee, his knee never straightened or bent all the way properly. So then it started to mess up his hip because his whole body was misaligned. So he just had knee and hip problems for like pretty much his whole life now. So Jeez. I was like, man, I, I have to just get through these last five minutes and everything will be okay. Just <laughs> suck it up, right? Yeah. <laughs> At the moment, you uh, suspect this is an LCL injury, which is probably uh, one of the more minor, or do you not? not yeah, I'm it? hoping it's LCL. I actually had, I'm thinking about it now, I actually uh, injured my fibula head on this side. I popped my fibula head out um, previous to this, like a few years ago. So I'm do hoping. You, sorry, how'd you do that? I forget what it was exactly. It was so long. I think it was like a purple belt, but. Uh, it some was, crazy purple belt shit. Yeah, <laughs> it was. Uh, I don't I forget exactly how it happened, but it healed pretty fast. So I'm hoping it's just a re-injury of that. Um, but this is definitely like the worst my knees ever felt. It's, I'm like limping around right now. Um, so I'm hoping it's not too serious LCL damage, and maybe it just the fibula head popped popped out, and went back in. Um, but as of right now, I have no stability. Like if I lean over my leg, I have no stability on the outside of my knee. So I think the ACL is fine, the MCL is fine. I think it's just the LCL and maybe the, you know, the outside of the meniscus. So Could be out for a little while, you think? We'll see. I have to go back to New York and get an MRI. So I'm back tomorrow. I should be able to get an MRI tomorrow or Wednesday. So we'll see how it goes from there. Nice. Okay, so that's the knee. But let's talk about the match itself because, uh, I mean, you guys, you actually got awarded match of the night. And I feel that was a very, very disturbing award because you guys put on an amazing show. So um, break it down for us. First of all, how do you rate your performance in that match? Um, you don't seem so happy. <laughs> I mean, I'm definitely not happy, uh, but I feel, I mean, this is like, people don't, people don't give you out credit like everyone, like I've said before. He's, be, he's beaten like literally everybody in the sport. He has wins over like the biggest names in the sport. Um, so, I mean, I feel happy i guess not satisfied but um happy with the performance i felt like i performed pretty well uh i but felt like satisfied I was, with the result yeah exactly i felt like i was uh i felt like i dominated the standing exchanges pretty well with the grip fighting um and then we got thrown off the stage and i was like yeah i don't want any more of that <laughs> um so then uh and i felt like i was dominating uh you know the ground exchanges as well um you know minus the end when uh when i almost got passed a few times but i felt like for the for the uh, good portion of the regulation i was i was uh you know, making him back away in the guard or making him come forward. And I hit the drag a few times and we went sweep for sweep. Um, so definitely a tough match. Definitely always, of course, want to have rematches with guys who I don't submit. Even in guys who I do submit, I like to have rematches with just to test my progression. Um, but, you know, happy with the with the performance, but not happy with the results, I guess, is the best. 
the best answer. Was there uh, anything that surprised you about Joao's game? Anything that he did that you weren't expecting? Uh, yeah, so I knew he was going to be really big. Um, I wasn't ready for his level of explosion. Like, uh, <laughs> the one point in the match, I was, like, in a perfect mechanical position, like a full top head and arm, with, like, him completely flattened out on his back. And, uh, like, most, like, some people will, like, pinch your elbow and bridge to the opposite side and be able to roll you over if you lean too far forward. But he just, like, bridged into my body weight and somehow just, like, rolled me over like a child. And I was like, how did that just happen? And I'm like, I'm like on bottom. And the reason why I hit the sweep right back wasn't because I was, like, yeah, good at the sweeping position. It was just because I was so pissed that I got swept. Like he bridged into me, and he wasn't supposed to be able to. That I was like, "Fuck this guy! I'm just gonna take him back over." <laughs> so he did pose a number of kind of really interesting challenges, right? Because first of all, he was huge. He weighed in at 263 on Friday, yes, and I remember seeing him in the, at the weigh-ins and kind of saying, "Hey, what's up, Joel? Oh, God." damn, you look big. <laughs> and I, I asked him how much he weighed, and he's like, oh, I don't know, like maybe 240-ish. And, well, we all know how big he was. Yeah. But, you know, that, that, was, that was a challenge in and, of, in and of itself. It's not the first time you've gone up against bigger guys, right? But, like, did anything about his jiu-jitsu or about his strategy, like, uh, maybe surprise you a little bit? Um, yeah, you know, he definitely, uh, he definitely engaged more than most people do. Um, so, you know, credit to him for that most people i have to chase across the mat um, whether it's on the feet or on the you know scooting towards them uh, but he definitely did engage uh if you see like some of my double koichis where i went to harass both of the feet weren't really working because he was actually leaning his head forward and trying to come into me um and you know definitely uh i thought that if i put him on bottom i've watched some of his matches i thought that if i put him on bottom that uh i'll be able to easily pass him and uh and finish him but like i said i wasn't ready for his explosion i think uh Thinking back, I think I should have played more of a loose passing game with Torian that's just throwing legs to the side so he had none of my body weight to control. But I'm just usually so confident with tight passing and guys like don't really just bridge me over in like the wrong direction. Um, <laughs> so I just wasn't ready for that at all. Um, but I think in hindsight, I should have used a more loose style of passing and went to throw bys and exhausted him with side to side pressure versus just trying to hold him in one place. Well, he's definitely one of the biggest guys that you've faced uh, at this level, shall we say? Yeah, because for sure. you know, you've. Because there's big guys, but there's, yeah. there's big guys that. You know, who are world athletic class. and world yeah. classes yeah. is, the, is the issue. So I guess an interesting learning experience for, for that, you kind of know a little bit better what to expect because, of course, it has been announced that later this year you are going to go into the IBJJF Grand Prix yes. in August. And they've already announced a couple of guys for that, including Bouchesha, yeah. Leandro Lowe, like, and Hulk. Yeah, Bouchesha is uh, a great test for Bouchesha because Bouchesha is like a trial run. Yeah, Bouchesha is like relatively the same size. He's like 260, 270, I'm pretty sure. Like people don't realize how big Bouchesha is. Oh, he's huge. They're like, oh, you should fight someone your own size, like Bouchesha. I'm like, Bouchesha is like 50 pounds heavier than me. He's not <laughs> anywhere close to my size. Um, but, you know, it's definitely a good chest test uh, for Bouchesha because those guys are pretty much neck and neck. Um, Bouchesha always gets the better of him because I feel like he just keeps the pace a little bit higher and uh, he's a little bit more dynamic in his movement. But, uh, you know, those guys are always head to head. It's like you're working your way through the uh, the video game bosses, right? Yes, they just yeah. keep getting harder. Yeah, get to the head boss. <laughs> yeah. But um, going back to the match again, obviously it was won via a single point that came as a result of a heel hook, a heel hook attack. So with Kasai rules, for people who don't know, um, you had a 10-minute submission-only period, and then uh, the second round was was points, correct? Yes. So in those, uh, in those five minutes, uh, the Kasai rules, there are no advantages, but they give one point for a significant submission attack yeah so how significant was it you got the you had the heel hook you 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 got in on the leg how did it feel um so yeah i entered in i uh, had his upper body and then when he went to pull the upper body away he had to step a leg up so i entered into an ashigarami uh and he uh he was he was smart and trying to immediately disengage but as he went to run away he exposed his own heel so as his head moved away, his heel became exposed, and then uh, it was pretty easy for me to get heel exposure and roll through. And on the roll through, when I made the switch to outside Ashigarami, there was uh, a good three or four pops. So, Ooh, um, really? Yeah, I, I definitely, I at least got pops on his ankle, possibly his knee. Um, I don't really know to what extent, but there was definitely some nice pops. Uh, there was definitely some grimacing from him. Um, and then as he leaned forward, he started leaning forward into me and pulling my knees open. And that was what caused me with the sweat. The heel wasn't perfectly on my wrist bone. So the sweat combined with everything else, uh, you know, caused him to heel slip. And then he started rolling forward. I tried to re-roll. Or said it started coming forward. I tried to re-roll. And, uh, and then the leg entanglement was completely 
was completely disengaged. So one thing about Joao going into the match is that people they imagined that the heel hooks specifically would be an area of weakness for him because his ADCC record is pretty good. You know, he's a two-time ADCC silver yes, medalist. But the one thing is the heel hooks. Mm, exactly. Yeah. His four submission losses in ADCC were all via heel hook. Um, do, do you think that, I mean, you know, it's no secret that you've got complete jujitsu, but you've also got a killer heel hook game, right? Mm -hmm. So do you think that he that he did a good job in, in kind of preparing for what threat you you posed? No, yeah, he was definitely good at, uh, you know, the whole thing that we try to do is we go between upper and lower body. Mm -hmm. um, so his whole thing uh, that he was doing was, it was hard for me to actually enter into his body for a long amount of time. So whenever I'd actually get grips on him, he'd always do good good job of stripping the grips before I'd be able to enter into the lower body. Um, and then it was hard for me to just enter into the lower body because he was ready for it. So my whole thing was how could I enter into the upper body first and then when he defends, go into the lower body because it was very hard for me to just go right into the lower body because of his head position and he was hips back most of the yeah, time. Yeah, posture-wise, I think it was interesting because, you know, he, he avoided coming up off his knees too much, you know. He was doing a good job of just basically just hiding his feet, right? Yeah, he would, he would, match, he would, he would match head height. So when he did have to step a leg up most of the time, it would be hard for me to actually get towards him. He would post shoulders and he'd have head his head matching my level um so when he did step a leg up it was actually hard to get to his legs so the whole thing was how can i displace his weight to get to upper body grips first and either go into sweeps like i did in the first couple of minutes uh or if he steps a leg up go into his legs like i did in the last uh in, in the overtime how much technical planning and study goes into your preparation in a match like kasai uh, pretty lot. So if it's just one person, it's the whole thing is the whole camp is based around that one person. Um, like, for example, with Vinny, like we know Vinny uh, is very good at flying arm bars. So the whole camp based around, uh, you know, the Vinny camp was how can I tire him out from the standing position without hanging on collar ties? Cause mm -hmm. If you hang on collar ties on Vinny, he jumps for flying jujis and flying arm bars um, and then goes into submission. So there's definitely a, a game plan for each guy, um, you know, trying to work on how do we beat their strengths and how we exploit their weaknesses um, and whatever they're good at. So let's say a guy's really good at attacking the back or really good at attacking arm bars, for example, we're always working defensively from those positions. Um, in a tournament setting, it's more of uh, we prepare for the best guys, the guys who think we're going to face. So there's two, there's two main guys we prepare for, the toughest guy on our side of the bracket, if we know what the brackets are, and the toughest guy on the opposite side of the bracket. And then, you know, if it's more than one tough guy, you have to sure. you know, prepare for those guys. But if it's a super fight, it's definitely it's just uh, you know the whole camp is based around that that one guy or that one rule set. If it's an EBI, for example, we do more overtime rounds. And what did you single out as Joao's toughest attribute? Um, so his his uh, his whole thing from the feet is uh, he's very passive in his grip fighting for the most part. He's uh, he just kind of puts hands on you. He doesn't move you with his uh, with the hands. He's his feet and his hands are pretty static from a, a grip fighting exchange. Um, He's, uh, he's not very good at defending people getting onto his legs, but when guys do get onto his legs, he's a very strong uh, Uchimata counter with overhooks. Mm. And that's what um, ended up taking you guys off the stage, right? Yeah. You get, you, it's funny, though, because you hit the mat, and you actually, you both slid off the yes, stage. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, uh, if you actually, I watched a Lucas Barboza match, because um, I knew that they fought at uh, the Absolute of Nogi Worlds, I'm pretty sure it was, uh, a couple of years, 2017. Uh, so I watched Lucas a few times, Joao, had a strong overhook counter when Lucas went to go knee pick, and knee pick's one of my favorite moves. Mm -hmm. um, Lucas went to go knee pick, and he hit him a few times with the with the Ujimata overhook counter. Um, so my whole thing was, how do I keep my feet in front of Joao's feet without letting him step a, a foot inside? And a few times I had a few off balances. I couldn't put him down with it, but I had a few good off balances with it. Uh, and then the one time we did fly off the stage, he managed to get his foot in the middle and hit me with the Ujimata. So... It was a wild match. It was a lot of fun. I gotta say, what what is it like fighting on Kasai? Because you know you you fought on there a, a second time now, second I believe. Time, yeah. yeah. So how how do you feel on fighting on that promotion? I mean, it's great. Um, you know, I'm pretty close with Holes. Holes is from Henzo's, and uh, and you know, become friends with Rich. So it's definitely uh, it's it's a pro event. Um, you know, you go to you walk into Kasai and you're like, wow, you know, this is like a professional, like well ran event. Um, everything's on time. Uh, you know, they pay me the night of, um, which is uh not guaranteed in, in the jiu-jitsu community. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been really great working with them. Uh, they're always trying to find me big matches. You know, yeah, it's good. You, you say that you're friends with Hollis and Rich, but they haven't exactly, you know, been doing you any favors <laughs> with the matches. You know, yeah, I mean, some always in Kasai Pro 1 yes. and then Joao now. It's like they're getting tougher. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's what I want. You know, I want yes. to compete against the best guys. Um, and that's the biggest issue for me is finding guys who actually want to compete against me. So any of the, you know, big 
good guys who want to compete is uh, you know that's right up my alley. Mm. So the the problem is just finding promoters to actually pay a lot of these guys. They just price themselves so high that no one can afford to to uh, you know, to pay them. But uh, do you think that the opponents are doing that on purpose though? It's a way of not having to face you. Um, some of them, yes. Some of them, no. Like, uh, you know, some of them don't really have, like, aren't active enough and don't really have the credentials to ask for like fifty thousand dollars for a grappling match. Um, and some of them do. Like, if you, if you know, if Boucher, you want Boucher to come have a match. Boucher is the most accomplished grappler ever. You know, he should be getting a lot it's of money. It's not going to be cheap, right? Yeah. You know, he, you know, he should be getting a lot of money. Uh, you know, he's a eleven time, twelve time world champion. He won the absolute. Yeah. He just gave it to Leon. Twelve time world champion, and I don't know what two or three time ADCC champion. So I mean, he's pretty much won everything multiple times. You know, that's a guy who should be making you know millions of dollars, in my opinion. Um, the whole thing is how do we get the viewerships to actually support those numbers? But it's changed a lot. I mean, think about it. You know, a couple of years ago, uh, you were there for like the. A sort of emergent professional grappling yes. scene, right? I, I mean, I haven't even been in the sport that long, but even when I was like a blue belt, I used to compete in like the biggest thing was like Grappler's Quest Absolute. It was like a thousand dollars to win a Grappler's Quest Absolute, and there was like six black belt world champions. It was like <laughs> an open weight division. It was like six black belt world champions, two ADCC champions, and I was like a, like a little blue belt, like walking in, like oh, man, I really hope I get this thousand dollars. <laughs> so that was like the biggest thing. Is like ADCC and like Grappler's Quest were like the two like most uh, lucrative things that you can do. As a grappler and now there are tournaments like um for example the ibjjf they have the bjj pro series where they give four grand for the winner and it's hard to get people to show up because yeah. it's like I, I don't know it's like okay there's so many opportunities to make money in in professional grappling now people yes. actually are everyone complains that there's, there's no money in grappling it's just because they don't actually want to get paid they don't work for the money um you know it's bittersweet being a grappler because like at 23 years old i make way more money than like a normal person, but like as a like a, as a professional athlete, I'm like I may as well be poor. Like compare me to like an NFL player, NBA player, I may as well just be a homeless. You're dude. on the bread line, yeah. yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so I mean, it's bittersweet, but you know, the whole thing is uh, is working towards those real numbers, and uh, you know, that's what we should be trying to do. You mentioned uh, getting the viewership to to the point where we can pay athletes more, and that kind of brings an interesting point up with rule sets. A lot of people are playing with rule sets to make it more viewer friendly. What what is the role of that and pure grappling? Like, like, can we get away from maybe crowning the best champions by promoting this fr fan friendly aspect? Is that going to be a problem, or do you think they have the same goals that we can be friendly and get the best grappler? Um, I think it has a lot to do with both. Um, I think uh, so. I think that you know, EBI as far as rule sets, EBI had it in the bag. Um, I think th I believe that uh, EBI 10, the one in Mexico, uh, which is the one with Gio and Eddie, I believe that had more viewers than like most of the UFC pay-per-views that year. Mm. Um, so I think that like they they had the formula and then they just like chose to go to combat jiu-jitsu for whatever reason. But I think that you know it, that that was a clear indicator that we do have the means to break through the barrier of having submission grappling and jiu-jitsu be a sport where most of the people who watch the sport actually participate in the sport to going to a place where most of the people who watch the sport don't actually participate. Um, just casual people who never train jiu-jitsu are actually just watching for entertainment. Um, so it's definitely possible. It's just how do we continue that? Um, and as far as, you know, all being nice to each other and still, uh, and, and still, you know, getting those numbers, uh, you know, it's definitely doable. Like George St. Pierre is you know, a super nice guy and never talked any shit. But mm. um, if you look historically at the, at the, most remembered and highest paid athletes. They're all very good inside the cage or in, in the mat or on the mat uh, and outside as well. Um, you have to be exciting in some way uh, to get viewerships. Um, and there's two ways to be exciting. You can either do it inside the cage with skills like George, or you can do it outside the cage. Some people don't actually have the skills to do it inside the cage, so they have to make up for it with talk outside the cage. Um, but when you get somebody mess. who's got it both, exactly, that's, that's yeah. superstar material, When you material, get someone right? like Mayweather who can perform, he wins all the time, and he just talks shit about people, that's when you start making, you know, the viewers, people are watching, people are coming to watch you win, people are coming to watch you lose, and, you know, that's where, that's where the money is. So that's kind of pretty much the model of what you do then, because, you know, you're very well known for your, uh, for your trash talk, you know, you yes. like getting under people's skin, and, um, well, if you talk trash, if you talk trash and you don't win, then you're just a clown, or if you talk right. trash and you don't compete, and you don't compete all the time, then yeah, you're just, you actually you're back just it a up. clown, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so people don't take you seriously until you actually, until you start talking shit, and then you actually go out and win matches, you do what you say you're gonna do. And it's interesting, though, because, like, I, you know, we have comments coming in on our live stream right now, and, 
And people are actually surprised like how humble you are when you're not right before a fight and trying to get interested in stuff. It's almost a, a shock for them. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like the things that I say online, like I actually truly believe in my heart. Like I think that I'm going to go out and crush everybody that I compete against. And, you know, that is, uh, th that's definitely what I believe. But I can't just like be going around telling everyone the fuck off and that I'm going to bang their moms and that I'm the best. Um, so, you know, I try to be like pretty personable when I'm actually, you know, go out, when I'm actually like going out in public and talking to people. Um, but, you know, the whole, I, I, I really believe that I'm going to go out and I'm going to be people. Uh, and I don't you really just don't have to be a dick about it. Right? Yeah. And like, I don't really, I don't talk shit to people unless they attack me. Like people online, like I never go out of my way to attack people. Someone's like, oh, Gordon sucks. I'm like, okay, well go fuck yourself then. <laughs> like <laughs> I don't go out of my way to just attack random people. They always start with me. Um, and that, that, I'm that, more than happy to go back. That came up recently, right? Because, uh, I mean, I lose track sometimes of exactly how many people you're getting into it, you know, with online and, and who it is right now, but they, they come and go, right? But um, just the most recent example is out of nowhere, uh, Urban Santos decides to start chipping away at you on Friday immediately after the Kasai so weigh-ins, right? Yeah. <laughs> and you guys have gone back and forth a fair bit, but like, you know, when, when that happens, you know, and he comes out of nowhere and he's trying to go after you, it's like, I mean, you kind of enjoy that, right? You like it when they come out. I don't know what they think because I just crush them every time. He like, <laughs> he like, I like posted, it was like a video of me weighing in. He posted like a chicken emoji on the flow grappling, I'm pretty sure it was, or like mm -hmm. a sigh. Yep. And then he posted like, like black metal fingers, like six black metal fingers on one of my posts. And I'm just like, I, I don't know if he knows that I know what the situation is because I was like, hey man, like Flo offered you a match like Gi and Nogi same day or same weekend. And you just like flat out said no. I was like, I don't know if he knows that I know this or not, but like there was supposed to be a match between us and I offered to do one in the Gi where you picked the rules and one no Gi where I picked the rules. We could do them same day or Gi on Friday, no Gi on Saturday. And you just flat out said no. So I was like, well, I don't know, like, what else you want? If you don't want to have a match, then I don't know what, you just want attention. And just to put this into perspective, that's right, because we have recently launched our own Flow Grappling Showdown event, which is a, a team versus that's team gonna challenge. That's going to be sick. I saw the Gracie fight team, right, versus Atos. No, it's it's a, it's a GF team, yes. Yeah. But yeah, GF team up against Atos, and we got like, you know, there's there's a ton of good guys. Lucas Hulk's going to be in there, Keenan, and they're bringing Max yeah. Jimenez and stuff. But um. You know, we, awesome. we wanted that as like a kind of the, the main super fight for the show, you know, because uh, it would bring obviously a ton of attention, right? And it'd be the crown, you know, the cherry on the top of the pie. But what, what do you think it is? Why, why do you think that these guys are, are talking so much shit? But then when it comes to actually trying to get them to sign on the dotted line, they just, they're nowhere to be seen. Um, you know, part of it, I think, is that uh, they don't want to lose to a guy that like just talks so much shit and is actually good. Um, I think another part of it is that they they actually know that I can do some missions. Like to go out and to lose to someone by an advantage or to lose to someone by two points isn't really a big deal. But like to go out into a match, it's the same thing with boxing. Like to go out and fight Mike Tyson, you're like, man, I can go out in the first 30 seconds and get knocked unconscious. Like it's the same thing with us. Like you can go out in the first 30 seconds and get your leg broken, get strangled, and you can go out and legitimately get embarrassed and finished in like a brutal way. Um, so I think that the danger of 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 uh, competing against anybody from our team uh, is what really makes people timid to compete against us. Um, we're actually going out to finish you, and we're good at finishing people. What do you think it's going to take to get these guys to sign up to to either to face you or to enter you know a, a tournament where you're also going to be present? Um, well, in some case, in some cases, there's just nothing. There's just nothing you can do uh, to get these guys to compete. Um, in some cases, it's just an absurd amount of money, which doesn't make any sense because the viewerships don't, su the numbers don't support the amount of money that they want. Um, or number three, it's just f doing it for free in an IBJ Jeff event, which makes zero sense because th they can like you for could example, get paid. Yeah, like, <laughs> like, could, like, yeah. like like Dylan Danis, like he was like, oh, they're like, oh, we want you to fight Gordon, and at the time, like he wasn't like credentialed or anything, and this was like a couple years ago, and. Uh, you know, like ten thousand dollars was a lot for a super fight. And it was like no one was getting that. Um, and he's like, "Oh, it has to be ten thousand dollars, or else I'm not going to do it." And someone's like, "Okay, I'll give you ten thousand dollars." And then he just didn't do it. And then what happened? He had to fight me for free at ADCC. He didn't get any money. So I don't know where these guys' heads are at. Like, you're going to have to compete against me one way or another. Like, either you're not going to because I compete in everything. Either you're not just you're not going to compete at all, or you're going to have to compete against me for free, which doesn't make any sense. 
Like if Bouchetian wants to compete against me, he should ask someone for fifty thousand dollars. We should set it up with the rule set, and then we should com- we should compete. We shouldn't do it for you know in the third match, in the semifinals, uh, perhaps at the ADC or at the IBJJF Grand Prix, and then one of us we compete, and then one of us walks away with zero dollars. We should everyone should be getting paid. Do you think it might also be the rule sets? You know, like I, we, we saw yeah, the IBJF sure. Grand Prix and, of course, no heel hooks in that. Uh, no Gi Worlds, uh, we definitely, we even said is the Gordon Ryan effect. You know, we, we saw many more people in that ultra heavyweight division yeah. than we normally would. Um, do you think guys think, oh, it's my chance? <laughs> yeah, I mean, definitely the rule sets, there's like, a, there's like an unspoken agreement to just boycott EBI, I think. I think uh, like they saw what happened to like ADCC like multiple time, like world champion, ADCC champion, uh, Yuri when he went to do the first DBI and everyone after that was like, yeah, I don't want to do that. Because people have strong feelings about the overtime rounds, right? Some people were totally in favor and, and a yes. lot of the kind well, of the, well, because, the more established because, jiu-jitsu guys hated it. Because the issue is everyone's jiu-jitsu game is based around not doing jiu-jitsu. They just have been training for 20 years. They know enough jiu-jitsu to avoid bad positions. They shoot past your guard, they score an advantage, and they, that's it. But when you actually do EBI overtime, it forces you to actually know jiu-jitsu. You have to be able to control and defend a certain position. It puts you in a bad spot. Most people spend 95% of their time not getting into bad spots. So when you actually put them there, they have no idea what's going on. So when you actually have to start in a fully locked arm bar or fully locked back position, most people, know, most people have no idea how to escape. So you actually have to do jiu-jitsu, and that's the issue for most people. Um, but I think that you know, with this Grand Prix coming up, like these guys know they're gonna have to fight me eventually. And I think that an IBJJF rule set is their best chance of actually winning. So they don't have too much of an issue with it. And obviously the, the Grand Prix is coming up in August. That's right around one month out from ADCC 2019, which yes. is which is no small matter, okay? ADCC comes around every two years. It's pretty much, everybody knows, it's the, the, the biggest no-gi world championship, you know, is the one that everybody wants. now. You're a gold medalist and a silver medalist in the absolute. What's yes. the plan for 2019? Um, so we need to know, I think, by this weekend what weight division we're competing in. So I'm debating between uh, under or over 99 kilograms. So I'm gonna not going out. back to 88, right? Not going back to 88. <laughs> I could right now, but I'm not. I'm not going to. I want to win a different division. Um, and obviously, it's just to win the absolute. Um, I want to win the absolute and uh, continue to do super fights while I start fighting uh, mixed martial arts. So when is the uh, the ETA for your MMA career to start? taking off uh whenever i don't suck uh <laughs> whenever whenever john thinks i'm ready to go out and and uh you know i don't want to go out and and look like a guy who's making his debut i want to go out and look like a guy who everyone watches and they're like wow that guy's good like th- that guy could be one of the best um so i want to i want to really go out and i want to have a, a great first performance um and right now you know as i said I, I still suck so whenever i feel like i can actually uh, go out and, and give good performances multiple times in a row uh, and fight a lot. Um, I want to be good enough where I can fight multiple times a year without having to keep uh, taking time off to progress. There's been some uh, talk of GSP maybe coming back sometime later this year. Would you be involved in any of those training camps? Would you be doing anything with him? Uh, definitely, for sure. I saw some things about him trying to fight Khabib or Khabib trying to fight him one or the other. Um, that would be definitely interesting. Uh, uh, I'm one of George's main training partners as far as grappling goes for uh for any of his camps, me and Gary, he comes down and we go up to Canada. So definitely if uh, if he has to fight Khabib, that's uh, you know, right up my alley, trying to hold him down and and uh, you know, beat him up. How would you uh, how would you maybe emulate Khabib's style? Everyone talks about his grappling for MMA being the most dominant in the game right now. I'm sure it's something you're paying close attention to. What what stands out to you about yeah, that? Yeah, so his whole thing is he has a, he's a very advanced uh, cage wrestling system. He's one of the best uh, fence wrestlers uh, in jiu-jitsu. Um, if you look at his open mat grappling and his shoot boxing, it's not, I mean, it's definitely good, but it's not anything like crazy that we've never seen before. It's not mind blowing, is it? Yeah. Um, he, uh, if you like, if you look at George's like shots, like George's, t- like George touch your legs and you just fall to the ground. Mm-hmm. Khabib like tends to shoot from further away and like gets to a leg and then it's a grinding process down to the ground. Um, so his, his fence wrestling, in my opinion, is much better than his, his open mat wrestling. He puts guys up against the fence and he puts them down. And he always says head over head so guys can never get up. And that's where he starts to get into the wrist and starts breaking guys down. And then that's where that's where his game is. Um, so a big thing would be uh, for George, I think, would be to uh, to work open mat wrestling, where I think he could put Khabib down with shoot boxing, and then to work a lot offensively and defensively on the cage. Because that's where Khabib is the best. Is that, is that a match you'd like to see, though? Yeah, for sure. I yeah. mean, uh, you know, they're both uh, great in the same domain. They're both good top players. 
Um, I think George has a distinct striking advantage, and I think George also has a distinct shoot boxing takedown advantage. I think that George will actually, uh, George is uh, famous for beating guys within their own domain. I think, uh, you know, he like he took Jake Shields down uh, and, and he, you know, put him on bottom. Matt Hughes, the same thing. Um, so George is very good at putting guys down on their backs who are guys who are supposed to put him down. He put Koscheck down. All these guys are supposed to be very good wrestlers. He always puts them down and makes them play from bottom position. Incredible, isn't it? This uh, guy who's uh, just a, a martial artist. He he didn't have the wrestling background. He yeah. went out and he made a point of learning that. So he yes, didn't, yeah. didn't come into it like the karate guy. The year, years <laughs> of wrestling like Khabib, right? Yeah. So, but um, the uh, the the MMA connection is um, you know, people might think that you're just a grappler. But tell us about the access that you have to 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 MMA training at. Hensel Gracie, because it's a it's a hub, right? This kind of gym, you have a bit of everything. But who are you working with, and and, and what are the kind of the options that are available for you? Um, so, I mean, people are pretty shocked to hear this, but uh, you know, John is my coach for everything. As far as uh, he's my wrestling coach, he's my jujitsu coach, he's my MMA coach, he's my striking coach. Um, John, people don't actually know this, but John John is fascinated with all combat sports, not just jujitsu. Um, he actually practiced Muay Thai for eleven years. In New Zealand, so he was big into Muay Thai, but um, he studies um, all Everything. combat sports yeah. equally. Yeah, he he watches boxing, the big greatest boxers, greatest Muay Thai guys, greatest judo guys, wrestlers. So uh, he's a, uh, I would say he's more knowledgeable in mixed martial arts than he is in in grapple and jujitsu and straight and straight jujitsu. That's and quite a statement yeah. considering how knowledgeable he yeah. is. And in people just people don't realize. People don't realize this, like, oh, John's your striking coach, you're going to get knocked out. It's like, no, like, John was, like, the biggest part of George's success. Like, he created the greatest fighter of all time. Um, so I think that uh, people are really underestimating John's ability to coach MMA, just like they underestimated his ability to coach grappling in the beginning. They're like, oh, all this guy knows is leg locks. Um, so it's just a matter of him producing a high-level MMA student besides George um, because, you know, George always has Frost as well. Um, you know, he's mostly a tri-star. Um, but John would teach George moves – he would come down because he was a garbage man at first. So John would teach George moves. He would come down for like a couple of days and then George would travel back to TriStar and he would teach Frost and the whole gym what John was teaching them. Frost was a black belt under John. Mm -hmm. um, so Frost would innovate and TriStar, um, but uh, a lot of the ideas and uh, you know, the moves would come, would come from, from New York with John. Via John. Yeah, so uh, and the combination of Frost and, uh, Frost and John has made, uh, you know, they produce one of the greatest fighters of all time. So I think people are really underestimating the ability of uh, of John the coach, you know, both grappling and and mixed martial arts. A, li a little bit of um, a question mark is, of course, is that when uh, when George was working with John, he was already a, a pretty well functioned mixed martial artist, right? He'd had access to striking, he'd had access to grappling, he'd had access to a bit of everything, but um, kind of. This is pretty much the beginning of your MMA, right? Yeah. It's like, you know, up until this point, uh, I mean, would it be fair to say that you're what, like 99% pure grappling? Or yeah, yeah. did you ever dabble? No. I mean, I sparred when I was like 15, like like two or three times at Tom at Tom DeBlast's school. But, uh, how did that go? So Tom DeBlast beat you up when you were 15, is that? No, Tom actually <laughs> didn't. Tom actually didn't. But how did that go? I actually, uh, there's this guy, Carlos, at Tom's, who... Uh, Who's like the he's like a 265 pound Puerto Rican. He's like the strongest <laughs> dude you'll ever meet. I was like 15 years old. It's my first time sparring, and uh, like the first time I ever sparred, it was just like a bunch of guys trying to knock each other out. And Tom was getting ready for one of his fights, so like there's no supervision because Tom has to spar too. He's his head, he's the head instructor, but he has to get his sparring in. So I'm like sparring with Carlos. Somehow I'm like a little like 140 pound 15 year old like sparring with Carlos. Carlos spinning back kicks me in the head and just KOs me. Like oh my, I woke up from my head hitting the ground. And I was like, and then I like continued to, I was like a retard. Like I can continue to spar for the whole rest of the session. He's like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. I got up, I did like three more rounds. It was just so bad. So like that was oh my, my that was the extent of my of my training before I met John. And, and I tell John this and John's just like, oh my God, how did anyone let that happen to you? <laughs> but uh, it didn't put you off. No, yeah. I mean, uh, I definitely, that's not what the plan is. I don't want to get hit. I don't like to get hit, but... Uh, you don't want to get spinning you know, back kicked yeah, in the face again? Yeah. The, the goal is to hit other people, not not to get hit. So so where did the desire to do MMA come from? Because, you know, when when you came into the jiu-jitsu world, um, people kind of knew you as like Gary's kind of uh, understudy almost, right? You were the guy who kind of like, you know, he was yeah. Gary's student. You came along from, from Jersey under Tom and Gary, and, and you kind of came up along, you know, part of the squad. Obviously, Gary's moved on to MMA, MMA. But um, at what point did you kind of think, yeah, I, I wouldn't mind a shot of that too? Yeah. Um, actually, it's uh, funny. 
I watched, uh, when I was like seven or eight years old, I watched a UFC, my first UFC fight, and it was a, a Hoist Gracie tribute. As the first match I ever saw was Hoist Gracie versus Keith Hackney. Oh, wow. And uh, I watched Hoist Gracie armbar him, and I, like, I remember thinking to myself, like, that's what I'm going to do when I, when I get older. Um, I had no plan. I didn't know how. I was just like, somehow, that's what I'm going to do. So I actually started training jiu-jitsu because I saw those Hoist Gracie fights, and I thought that jiu-jitsu was the best. But I actually started training just to fight MMA. Like, my whole goal – that's why I was, like, sparring at 15, because my whole goal is to fight MMA. My goal is never to be, like, the greatest grappler or greatest of all time grappler. It was to be, like, the greatest fighter of all time. And then that I just, just got, happened by accident? Yeah, I just got <laughs> roped into jiu-jitsu, and now I just find myself <laughs> – and then now I just find my everyone's like doubting me still and like talking shit. So I feel like I have to keep competing to just keep winning everything in grappling. So I just keep getting sucked back into grappling. But my ultimate goal is to be the best in MMA. So had you already planned to kind of be doing MMA by now? Because you know what are you now? Twenty three. Twenty three. Yeah. Twenty three. Yeah. So I never really had any plans. I just uh, I knew that eventually I would start fighting. Um, and then once I actually got roped into jujitsu, I wanted to prove that I was the best in jujitsu first. I wanted to feel like I. Uh, I solidified my legacy in grappling, um, and uh, I felt like the best way to do that was winning ADCC. Uh, I, I didn't want to move to MMA. It felt like I left, like I left something behind where I didn't that I didn't finish. Um, so I, I wanted to win ADCC before I started fighting, and then I, I actually wanted to start training in the gi and start competing in the gi. But it's just not as exciting as, as MMA training, and it hasn't doesn't really have any relevance. Uh, like you know, all the gripping and the sport, like playing worm guard and all that stuff. It's you can't do that in MMA. There is um, a, there is a strong t tradition of either uh, jujitsu world champions or ADCC champions then going into uh, MMA and and making amazing careers. I mean, we're thinking of guys like Damian Maia, Fabrizio Verdum, Jacare, yeah. um, even most recently Rodolfo Vieira. You know, he he pretty much retired from grappling immediately after winning ADCC yes. 2015, yeah. and uh, you know he's been doing pretty good since then. But um, is that it? It's like if if you if you let's say if you don't win ADCC like later this year, it's like are you going to stick around and make sure you do it again, or are you going to still go to MMA? It's like do you uh, have to do that first? Uh, no, I'll probably I'll probably do both regardless. Like I'll probably continue to compete in ADCC and fight at the same time. So regardless of whether I win or not, uh, I'll probably just keep I'll probably just start fighting and then continue to compete in ADCC. Uh, depending on progress uh, progression, I might even have a fight before ADCC comes up. Wow. Um, and if, if that's the case, if I feel confident enough, uh, if that's the case, then MMA is my main focus at that point. Like right now, I don't have a contract with anyone, and I'm, I'm just you know progressing in, in MMA, and grappling is still my main focus, but I want that to change to MMA being my main focus, and grappling still being something that I want to do at the highest levels, but... Uh, but having a kind of not on the back burner, but having it second to MMA, where if I actually start getting into fights and there's people going to punch me in the face and I have a contract with an organization, um, MMA is always going to come. MMA training is going to be first and grappling is going to be second. But I still want to compete at the highest levels of grappling as I fight. Um, but I want to start to make the transition from being a full time grappler to a full time mixed martial artist. Have uh, promotions always started reaching out? MMA promotions. Uh, yeah, I mean, I haven't, I mean, just announced like one time that I was going to start fighting, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm definitely, I'm talking uh, with uh, some of the guys from One, because um, they're a great show. It's a great way to, uh, you know, to build my brand, especially in Asia. I don't really ever compete in Asia, so it's a great way to build my brand over there. Have you um, already been to one of the One events? Because Gary's for I haven't, no. Every time, every time he's there, I have to like, I might, I just have it, ha happened to have like a seminar that day or something where I, ha I had like previous uh, things that I had to go to, or I had it like one time when Tom went and he had a seminar, I had to cover the seminar for Tom. Um, during his first fight. So I'm definitely looking to make it out there. Uh, maybe even do like a grappling event for them or something beforehand like Gary did. Like Gary did, yeah. yeah. He fought Shinya Yoki, okay, yeah. right? Because like just to get used to it, like people don't realize like the stress of like even doing like a grappling event, like even an IBJJF event where no one even cares. Like you go in and you're blue belt and you go in and there's 15 mats and no one's even watching you, but you still like freak out. You're like, oh my God, you're you know tense. Like the pressure, yeah. the adrenaline. But like going, like it's a completely different world going into uh, going into a stadium with 25,000 people and competing in the octagon or a, or a, a cage where everyone's looking just at you. Um, so just to go in and even just to do a grappling match, just to get used to the spotlight and having that many eyes on me is, uh, is a good experience, I think. How do you feel uh, in situations like that? I mean, whether it is a, um, whether it's an open tournament, like you say, you know, let's use Nogi Worlds as the most recent example, um, or whether it's ADCC finals when it's just the one match going and it's the arena full of people. But um, what's, your, what's your kind of mindset like and what's your general kind of state of being as you go into one of those matches? Um, so 
I, I love it, honestly. Um, you know, usually I'm a pretty slow starter. So, like, super fights aren't really, like, my thing. Like, short-time super fights. I like to do, like, either tournament styles or, or like, longer, like, 20-plus minute matches. Because as I get going, the longer the matches go. It's so, like most people towards the end of a tournament kind of fade out. But I start to hit, like, my peak as the, like, the last ADCC. Like, my first match of each day were, like, referee decisions. But then, like, the second the second day was mo the most matches. I had, like, a ref's decision, and then I just, like, submitted everybody until the finals of the absolute. Everyone was getting tired, and I just started I started picking up steam. I started to get more confident as we, as I go. Um, and, you know, I like crowds. Um, you know, a lot of people shy away from crowds, and they don't really embrace it, and they kind of feel timid. Um, you know, the crowds pump me up. I feel like uh, I walk out, and, you know, people – some people walk out, and they're like, you know, these people all, all here are all here to watch me. You know, what if I lose? What if this? What if that? And I just walk out, and I'm like, you know what? These people are here to fucking watch me. That's why they're here. <laughs> Let's give I'm them a show. Man. So <laughs> yeah, I, I I like the crowd, and uh, I think that it's a uh, I think it's a big part of of being a competitor is uh is being able to embrace a lot of eyes watching you. Because um, you know, I noticed that you know, just right before the match, for example, at Matt's side, you know, some guys are slapping themselves. They're you know getting really, really super hyped up. Yeah, that's not me. Uh, <laughs> if it's Leandro Lowe, he's usually dancing. You know, it's like, but no, you're like you're you're always like super calm right before you get on the mat, right? Yeah, I uh, I try to make it as close to training as possible. Um, John always emphasizes that what we do out on the mat or you know in a fighting situation, it's the same thing that we do every day, just in a different setting. Um, sure, some things are different. The lights are different. The people are different. The opponent's different. But the things that are different aren't the things that matter. Um, the lights don't matter. The crowd doesn't matter. The noise doesn't matter. The music that doesn't matter. None of that matters. The, the, what matters is that you're going out, you're facing someone, and everything that you do is the same thing you do every day. All the grips are going to be the same. Everything's the same. The things that are different are irrelevant. Everything that you actually do that matters, which is going to win you the match, are the same. You go out, it's you versus somebody. That's what you do every day in training. So I don't like to slap myself around and like, get all pumped up. I just like to go out and compete. It's just another day of training for me. Because the one thing I was going to say as well is that um, you're not an emotional competitor, right? No. Like you see some guys, they get into like a rage in the middle of the match. They start freaking out because something doesn't go their way. Or, you know, they, they carry a lot of emotion and they use it and they direct that yeah. against that's their because, opponent. That's because there's a misconception that things that win matches are character traits and physical attributes. Um, you know, who's the toughest, who has the most heart, um, who's the strongest physically. Um, but that's, that's not the way it works. My, my whole thing is whoever's going to win the match has the most knowledge, um, both technically and tactically, because, uh, you know, a lot of times the person who wins the match isn't the best at jiu-jitsu, but they play a tactical, a tactical game the best. Um, so, uh, you know, our contention is whoever wins the match is going to have the most knowledge. It's a battle of knowledge, and whoever knows the most is going to win the match. It's, it's, it's a science. Okay? It's essentially, you know, we're doing physics with the body. That um, is a very interesting concept. So, you know, it whoever, is scientific. Yeah, right? whoever, whoever knows, whoever has the most knowledge on how to do the sport is going to win the match, not whoever is the toughest. You've been uh, very vocal about your team being more methodical, more scientific with your approach, both to training and to actual competition. You think there's a, a big gap there between majority of schools in jiu-jitsu that sort of maybe have a haphazard style of learning and competing. Could you explain that a little bit to yeah, us? Yeah, the whole the systems thing, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so the whole question in jiu-jitsu is not, not how can I get better? Because if you do jiu-jitsu for 20 years, obviously you're going to get better. The whole question is how can I get better in the shortest amount of time possible? Um, you know, you have these guys going out and competing for 20 years and then you have you know john teaching us and i've been training with john for four years uh john's whole thing is that you can he thinks that you can completely reinvent yourself or compl or get to the highest level in whatever you're doing in five years or less um so take a completely new skill and in five years you can be world class at that at that skill wow um and you went from no offense but you went from an average to a purple belt yeah to, to a world-class world class yeah. black belt adcc champion yeah. Yeah, and there's multiple examples of this uh, in real life. Um, there's a there's a ton of people who have went from you know, you know, twelve year olds in wrestling uh, to you know world champions at seventeen years old. There's a there's a ton of examples of this. Um, so the whole question is how can we get better faster? Um, and with John systematizing everything, he puts us in these, in these positions that we spend more time in than anybody else. So for example, uh, the back the back attack system. 
you know, instead of just doing a live roll where we're just rolling around, we do live rolls obviously too, but instead of just putting us in, in a live roll where, you know, anything can happen, he puts us in these niche positions where we spend more time than anybody else. So provided we can keep our opponents in those positions in within those systems, we can always beat them because overall we don't have more experience than them on the mat, but in those positions we have much more experience. You get them. the reps in? Yeah, so when you, when you start to systematize everything, and you have multiple systems, now we can start to chain these systems together. So for example, like the video you guys posted the other day of me doing the Kimura to the, uh, we use a leg lock system. When, when, when that fails, then we go into Kimuras. When he turns into you, then we go into back attacks, and that leads into triangles and to arm bars. So you, you use these systems to keep your, opponent, your opponents within these systems where you have much more experience than them within those niche positions, um, and then you learn to move around the body through using limb exposure, moving from Kimuras to triangles to back attacks to leg locks. Um, and that way you can move around your partner's body, keeping a chain of ch chain of attacks going. Your partner can never break your chain of attacks, and then you're just attacking the whole match with submission, sweeps, et cetera. That's fascinating. I'm glad you asked that, Chase. <laughs> yes, I wanted to ask, um, where did you start with John? What, what did John sort of target as the, your first intro to the system, or where did you begin? Um, so John's whole thing is how do, how do I exploit the weakness of, the, of current grappling? Um, and in our case, it was leg locks. Um, you know, so you started with leg locks with John. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I started. I basically came in and I was just like a like a tough blue belt, purple belt. I started training consistently when I was a purple belt, um, but I was like a tough purple belt. I would just like do knee slices from half guard and like just try to knee slice as hard as I could. And then I just kept coming in and I would train with Eddie and he, I would just knee slice him to cross Ashigami every time and I'd get heel hooked and I'd be like, this isn't working. Um, so I'm like John, like how do I defend these leg locks? And he's like, learn how to do them. So I'm like, fuck, that sounds harder than that. Then that's not the answer I wanted. So uh, he like he like started teaching us leg locks, and then I started doing leg locks. And because no one else really practiced them, it was very easy to have early success with uh, with the leg locks because no one really did them. Um, and everyone was like, oh, they're just leg lock leg lockers. They're just leg lockers. Um, but you know, everyone doesn't realize like John always has a plan. There's always a plan for something. And his plan in the beginning was just to exploit the weakness of modern day grappling, which was leg entanglements. And then once everybody started worrying about our leg entanglements, then we started taking everybody's back. Then we started doing other things. A question um, for you, actually. Yeah. Do you think that people have kind of caught up in the, the arms race, you know, the, the whole leg locks? Because you, you purposely, as a team, kind of kept that information to yourselves. And people did their best to figure it out, right? You had a lot of people kind of studying your matches. But now, obviously, John's been very active in his teaching, yeah. the seminars, the, 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 the products and stuff. Do you think that people are catching up? Um, as a whole, yes. Um, when you go to when, I, when we go to seminars and we teach, like two through two or three years ago, you go to a seminar and you like have all these like cool moves that you're going to show, and then you get there and you realize like people can't even perform the most basic of moves. You have to like spend like a whole hour just explaining like what the leg and like what the leg position is, and you know people just it was a disaster. Um, but now that the DVDs are out and you know John has been making all these instructionals with uh, with the BJJ Fanatics guys. Um, people are really starting to understand what we're doing. Um, so they watch the instructionals and they kind of know what to expect if uh, and they have a little bit of idea of what's going on when they go to seminars. Um, as far as high level competitors, uh, I think it's not the opposite, but it's different. I think uh, they become better at defending them um, for the most part. Um, you know, guys like, uh, guys, there's a few guys who have creative ideas like Felipe has like really good back takes and stuff that he does from everywhere. Um, but uh, most high level competitors I think are too, are too caught up in their own in their own game to really accept that that's something that they have to learn. So their whole thing is just to play a negative game to not to avoid getting put into leg entanglements, but not actually to they're not confident enough and they don't practice or even try to learn like getting into a, a leg fighting shootout and out leg pummeling people. Um, so I think that uh, they kind of just it's like I said, everyone spends ninety five percent of their time not getting put into bad positions. But once you actually get put there, you have no idea what to do. Um, the whole thing is to really envelop yourself into whatever you're bad at and practice it until you're good. You know, just like Travis did with Jiu Jitsu. Um, you know, he was a world class judo player, but he really enveloped himself in Jiu Jitsu and got world class at Jiu Jitsu. Like he's a world class Jiu Jitsu black belt. Um, so the whole thing is to is to really envelop yourself into the things that you're bad at until eventually, you know, you're better than everybody else at them. And that's I think the uh, the fault of most high level grapplers. It's hard to adjust when you've been doing something so um, so convincingly. I would guess you would say for the last twenty years and winning with with your game. There's and not then, a lot of incentive to yeah, change. Yeah, and then for someone to come in and just completely disrupt that entire that entire aura that you have of you know 
the things that I'm doing aren't working anymore. So tell us what a uh, what a, an average session looks like then, because you mentioned about how you do a lot of um, training where you'll be based around specific positions that that kind of tie into the uh, the the systems that you were talking about. So is this a lot of like situational drilling? Yeah. Uh, um, so uh, it depends on what tournament is coming up. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, an average an average day as John starts, we do usually in the afternoons at least uh, probably thirty minutes of standing, twenty five thirty minutes of standing position. every session. Uh, yeah, in the in the mornings it's just on the ground, in the afternoons he starts on the on the feet. Um, so we do standing position first, and then we do another thirty minutes of ground drilling, then we do six six minute matches. Um, it's mounted position first, escaping and controlling mount. The goal is and just hold your partner and mount the goals to move around body. Um, create movement, expose limbs, and get to submissions. So let me ask, if you got a submission or if you lost that position, would you reset in mount or? Yeah, reset and the other person's on top. Got you. So we switch top and bottom. Um, you can move to side control, you can take the back. Um, if your partner returns to half guard, doesn't count. The whole thing is the bottom person has to get two knees either around or in front. So full butterfly guard, full close guard, ashigurami, X guard, something like that. And then you stop, reset. Yeah, exactly. Um, and the second round is turtle position. Uh, because turtle position is a is a huge position uh, and one of the most common positions in ADCC because of the point scoring. When you actually take someone down, people don't concede takedowns, so they turn to turtle position and they it's try to get up. One of the only there. tournaments where people do that. Yeah, and uh, it's a it's a very under um, under examined position in jujitsu because wrestling you just do stand ups and stuff, but then the hands come away from the neck and there's no there's no uh, strangled defenses. So that's one of the big positions that we're uh, that we're experimenting with. Um, so it's turtle. The whole thing for the guy on bottom is to fully regard. The whole thing for the guy on top is to take the back and get submissions or stay, you know, out of the legs. Uh, and the third round is close guard. Um, we're not really big on using close guard um, because it's just, I mean, for me, it's tiring. I mean, I have a good close guard, but it's just you know, playing outside position and constantly bringing guys into you, it's just pulling your knees into your chest. It's just more tiring playing outside position versus playing inside position like butterfly guard. Um, but our opponents all play close guard, so John makes us be good at it, being good at opening close guard. And you know, the worst thing you see is like guys fear getting swept in close guard, and they just sit there for 20 minutes, not standing up or doing anything. So the whole thing is, you know, how can we open close guard and on a good opponent and and pass? Uh, and then the next three rounds are standing rounds. Um, so we and just then do, that's just full yeah, live. Yeah, just full live. Uh, and then on the weekends we do something called scrimmage training. Um, this is uh, this is pretty. Um, it's great for MMA, it's great for IBJJF, but mostly ADCC rules. So we'll do scrimmage training where we start on a leg, where one person has a single leg, one person has a double leg, um, and then we go from there. And the first person to score under an ADCC rule set is the winner. Um, so it, 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 really, uh, it really enforces the idea of, one, mechanics in wrestling on how to actually put someone down, a resisting opponent down, so it gets you good at actually finishing takedowns when you get to the leg. And it also enforces uh, the person on defense um, to not concede takedown points, to be able to get back up to their feet without without giving too much back exposure, um, without accepting just being taken down and just quitting and laying on your back, but also not going to scramble away and getting strangled. How long do these rounds go for, these scrimmage rounds? The scrimmage rounds are brutal. Um, it's usually, <laughs> they're supposed to be six minutes. We only do them on the weekends because it's too dangerous and slippery and there's people everywhere when there's, uh, when there's normal classes. But on the weekends, we usually do... Uh, it's usually like six six minute rounds or five six minute rounds and then it's supposed to be one six minute rounds of scrimmage training but john's so fascinated by it that if he sees a good match going on he usually makes it like 10 or 12 minutes so like usually like 30 minutes of live training and then like scrimmage training where there's no break because it's like you're essentially you're wrestling but a lot of wrestling is passive you just play out here but this is you start on a leg and then you have to go and you put a guy down then you reset he's on he's on offense now so it's definitely exhausting but it makes the world of difference when you're actually preparing for these competitions it sounds super high intensity yeah it is yeah mm -hmm. and, and it, that added uh it's high intensity but we actually we have goals of what we're doing we're not just yeah, yeah. it teaches us what we should be doing from there we're not just grabbing legs and okay go. and of course you know rolling is competitive at any time but it sounds like a little extra com yeah. competitive yeah. right yeah it definitely is especially when you're going with some especially when i'm going with some of my own size like uh we, <laughs> we have like like nick rodriguez like wrestled d3 um, and he's like huge, like 230 pounds. Like I have to go with Kyle Sermonera, who was like an Olympic alternate. So like those Nick are- Nick actually, he uh, very recently, he just took, uh, I believe it was silver at the ADCC trials uh, East Coast, uh, right? Bronze, I believe. Yeah. Bronze, right, yeah. okay. And um, uh, I got told that he'd basically been training jujitsu for like months at that point. Is yeah, that he, right? he'd been training less than six months jujitsu. He wrestled like division three for one year um, and wrestled in high school. But uh, he, uh, 
he just been trained. He got his blue belt actually on the podium. He, uh, <laughs> been wrestling for six months. That's a badass but, yeah. white belt. <laughs> yeah, he, uh, he comes to Hendo's like a few times a week. He lives like deep in the South Jersey, so it's hard for him to get there. But uh, he's trying to get enough money to be able to to train to Hendo's more. Um, but so yeah, he comes up two or three times a week. Sorry to interrupt, but no, I mean, just th- th- this is fascinating to me because you know. Uh, I always wondered like what access you had to larger training partners and I asked John this on Saturday just after your match with Joao and uh, and he said oh yeah Gordon's not that big like you know we've got plenty of big guys for him to train yeah. with so you mentioned Nick uh, he's what a solid 240 yeah it's like 230 230 240 yeah. okay and then there's this Kyle is uh, is yeah. pretty big too right there's uh there's a couple other guys there's um uh Doug he just won the uh, the Masters Nuggy World and Doug this was, that was his first time ever competing in jiu-jitsu. I've watched Doug train with and train with like world-class black belts and watch them have the look of, I want to commit suicide on my face. <laughs> Who the is this man? Because <laughs> and, and, they come in and he's like one of the like old school like Dan Hur black belts, like 220 pounds, and he's like very good. And no one knows who he is. So like world-class guys come in and they train with him and it's just like a brutal beatdown most of the time. Um, so Doug is like, you know, one of my main training partners. Um, you know, Kyle is one of my main training partners. Uh, Jason Lees is an ADCC veteran. He's one of my main training partners. Tom the Blast obviously is one of my main, my main training partners. Um, and we have a couple of uh, guys who are uh, who are a little bit older. Um, we have Big Marlin, Big Ryan. Those guys are like between 250 and 270, 275. <laughs> I Darryl. like that they both have big in front yeah. of their names. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. no yeah. doubt. Yeah. This, this guy, we have this guy Daryl. He played uh, Division One college football. He's like six six, three hundred pounds. So he's like a, he's like a, he's like, a, he's like an athletic freak. He's a black belt. Um, so there's definitely big guys to train with. The hard thing always is finding big guys who are good who are also athletic. Right. Um, is right. The, the mix of everything is is the issue. Um, but we have definitely have some big athletic guys who are good. Um, uh, but uh, big guys are there's no short shortage of big guys at Henzo's. We definitely have big guys, and like John said, I'm not that I'm not that big. I'm like one of the like as far as big guys, I'm one of the smaller big guys. They actually have a they have they have a group called the Dancing Bears at Henzo's, and uh, I'm sorry, they're, they're called the Dancing Bears, and it's like it's like a, a group of guys who are all over 200 pounds. You got to be at least 200 pounds to be in the Dancing Bears. Um, so <laughs> what do like, they? What's the like, club do together? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's like uh, the, like the the initiation is they give you a honeycomb. Like if you're in the if you're in the Dancing Bears, they like they like put you into the group. They give you a honeycomb, and uh, and then you're a Dancing Bear. So I like just broke I broke 200 pounds. They're like, all right, you can have it. I'm like, yes, I'm in the Dancing Bears. But you're gonna keep so, the weight up, right? Yeah, if you drop yeah, underneath, yeah, take it away. Yeah, take away the honeycomb. <laughs> That's incredible. Man, um, what about ADCC trials this weekend then? We, we mentioned uh, 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 Nick, your training partner, that he took bronze in the uh, East Coast. West Coast is coming up this weekend. Um, so I saw that Nick is signed up, that he's going to go for a second shot. Uh, are you going to be there? I will be there. Awesome. And anybody else we might know? I think we have. We should have a person in every division um, besides maybe the female division. I know uh, Nat Santoro is doing the under-135 female. Uh, over one f- over 135, we don't have anybody. 66, we should have Nikki. Great. Uh, 77, uh, I think Jason Rao. He hasn't been training with us lately, but I think Jason Rao is doing 77. Uh, 88 is Matt Tesla. 99, Doug is doing 99. Big Doug uh, is doing 99, which uh, should be interesting because he's so good. He just has to learn how to compete, the, the nuances of competing. So ADCC trials is no easy easy task for your second jiu-jitsu competition. But, um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know, he's competing. And then uh, over 99 is Nick. So we have a person for pretty much every division, I'm pretty sure, this year. Wow. So your younger brother, Nicky, how old's Nicky now? 17. 17. Okay, so already an ADCC veteran. I think he was actually yes. one of the youngest in history, right? Yeah, he was 16, I believe. And yeah. Uh, yeah, 16. Did pretty good, you know? He went out there on, like, what, 24 hours notice when Justin Rader got sick and, yeah. and stepped up and had a, a, a bomb burner of a match with AJ Agazam, who mm-hmm. went on to take silver. Um, how different is Nicky now compared to two years ago when he had his first ADCC taste? He's not even the same grappler. Um, like, if Nicky competed against Nicky back then, he would submit him in, like, less than a minute. Um, like I said, the whole thing is how can we get better over a short amount of time? Um, you see these guys that have a their game... Uh, that they have like pretty much since brown or black belt and then they have that same game for the rest of their lives um you know every time that we go out to compete we're we're different grapplers um you know there's a, there's a few grapplers who go out and uh and you, i watch them and i'm like wow that guy is better significantly better than he was uh last time he competed and you know felipe is one of those guys he goes out and uh 
every time he competes, you see him do something different. Right. And that's the, that's the key to being successful for long amounts of time. Um, you know, anyone can go out and be successful for, you know, they go out and they win worlds for one year, for example. Okay. But that's great. No one knew who you were. And now everyone is studying you because you're the current world champion. The whole thing is how can we be successful for a long amount of time while everyone's studying to beat you because you're the best guy. Um, so we go out and we're, you know, we're different grapplers every time we go out. Every time you go out to see Nikki, he gets better and better and better. I mean, he just went out and submitted Imanari, who has literally been doing, he's been competing at high level since before I was born. <laughs> um, so, you know, to go out for him and, and, to, and to submit someone like that is, uh, is insane in my opinion. What's the thing that, um, not everyone has access to high level training partners and, and teams. What's the way a person can take control of their own training and, and really work to improve on, on their own? Yeah. Um, so... First of all, you have to work as hard mentally as you do physically. Um, everyone goes to training and they get a hard physical workout. That's what most teams are. They have a bunch of tough guys in a room. They go in, they get a hard physical workout, they go home sore, and they feel you know accomplished for the day. Um, mental work is the hardest kind of work and the most avoided work. Um, it's, it's hard to go home after a long day of physical training and watch tape and study matches. Like, <laughs> I remember when we used to, when John used to teach us leg locks in the beginning he used to really uh emphasize mechanics of breaking he wants us to be comfortable if we do get to a submission we have the mechanics to actually break someone so he used to send us videos we would, like train all day and then we used to go home he used to send us videos of leg locks of multiple videos of leg locks not working and multiple videos of leg locks where people's leg would just break in half oh my god he would make us spot the difference he would make us distinguish the 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 main factors on why what mechanically made this move work versus made these fail. Um, so the whole thing is first to, to understand the underlying principles and then to work to problem solve around those principles. So how can I, if I have a problem, you have to create, uh, you have to have creative and robust ways of solving those problems. So you have to figure out first what the problems are that you're trying to solve and then figure out reliable ways to solve those problems. Um, so the, the biggest thing is to work as hard mentally as you do physically. And that is comes down to studying tape more or less. Yeah, studying tape. Um, you know, for me, John, I have John to study tape. I study tape as well, but John is the does the bulk of the studying tape. Um, and also, it's to it's to integrate other forms of grappling into jujitsu. Um, John takes a lot of stuff from wrestling and makes it uh, applicable to jujitsu. A lot of stuff from judo and throws it into into our training. Um, so, because you have to remember, jujitsu is very young as a sport. Um, there's things that a lot of jujitsu guys don't do that would work very well but they're just from judo, so no one ever sees them. Or they're from wrestling, so no one ever sees them. And maybe they don't have access to that information as well, right? They haven't sorted out, and they haven't necessarily been around good judo guys to learn what that exactly, is. Exactly, but there's a bunch of tape on judo guys. Like, John has access to good judo guys, but he also watches, you know, the Olympics. Like, he sits down and watches judo for hours and hours and hours. Um, so I'm fortunate to have him because all he does is he buys knives, he, like, gets <laughs> knives and, like, cuts paper in the middle of the mats. Um, and then he goes into his office, he watches tape, and then he goes to do like his hip rehab with like kettlebells, and then like he goes home and like reads books or like watches more tape. So, um, you know, he's like our, our guy to study tape, and then he brings, because he can't do the moves himself, so he brings us, hey, I saw this yesterday, hey, I have an idea. Um, see how you can use this and see how you can make it better. Um, a lot of the things that he does is he, he takes moves from the best guys, and he says, how can I make this mechanically more sound? Um, so a lot of stuff that he does, like, it's very similar to Marcelo. Like he was a big inspiration for John, I believe, um, when uh, when he first started with his sumigachis, his butterfly sweeps, and his X guard. John just said, you know, how can I how can I take these and make them more effective? Um, and he started adding the leg locks and all that and, and too. That's interesting because when you see a technique applied in a match, it's usually not as clean as it should be, right? Yes, yeah. Because, you know, a match is a chaotic situation. There's a lot of variable factors, a lot of resistance and stuff. So sometimes a winning technique can actually look pretty sloppy. Yes. You know, it's done under, you know, a high stress situation. Uh, so it seems that your goal is to is to look at those winning techniques, to take them, to identify the what makes it work, refine it, and then sort of replicate it as perfectly as possible uh, in competition as you did in training. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the thing is like, you have to actually know what's going on. Like, for example, you can ask someone, who's going to win this scramble? And one person will tell you, oh, whoever fights harder is going gonna, is gonna to be able to get one, is the one that's going to get on top. And that's, like I said before, it comes down to people think that characteristics win matches. Um, but the, cl the clear answer is whoever's head and hips are higher than your opponents is going to win the scramble. So you should be able to watch a match 
and for whatever move you're looking at, you should be able to know exactly why that move worked versus why that move failed. What's the critical point at which my guard's gonna be past now versus when I can actually recover? Um, did he get past my knees? Did he get past my elbows? Is he chest to chest? Um, going for an armbar break, is the, is the elbow on the right hip? Is it over the breaking fulcrum? Going for a leg lock, um, am I hip to hip? Or do I have high hands? Is everything in place? So you should be able to look at a move. I mean, obviously it's easier said than done. You should be able to look at a move and know exactly why it worked versus why it failed. Damn. So John obviously is, uh, is, is well known for being studious and this is something that he expects of you guys as well, right? Yes. He, like, he gives you homework. Yeah. <laughs> He's, he wants us to be as good of, uh, as good as teachers as, as we are competitors. Um, so he takes really he takes a lot of pride in, in having us you know actually know what we're doing and being able to di diagnose matches. Now you mentioned there about the mental side of, of training as well. Now the mental side can be studying, but um, usually when people mention uh, mental training as well, they're often referring to things such as visualization and um, even sports psychology techniques and stuff, self-talk, things like that. Is that anything that you do? Um, for me, I'm, I'm more on the technical side, like, cause a lot of people do that for, for like confidence and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, for me, my confidence comes from, comes from knowledge. Um, I, the reason why I'm so confident is because I, I truly believe that I know more about anyone in this sport, um, about, about jujitsu. I know more about jujitsu and about grappling than anybody else in the sport does. And th that's what makes me so confident that I'm going to win. I can watch a match and be like, I'm better than this guy. And of course, you know, if people don't want to do jujitsu, they can stall you out and you know, maybe score a point here or there. But I know if push comes to shove and I actually get into a real jujitsu exchange with the person, I know that I'm always gonna win that exchange because I know more than them. Interesting. So um, who who do you look to as examples within jujitsu? Because you know, you mentioned about how John uh, Marcelo Garcia was an inspiration for him and he went off and, and studied him. Is there anybody that you look to, any favorite competitors or from past or present? Yeah, um, coming up actually it was Keenan um, when I was like a blue, because Keenan got his black belt when I was still blue belt. Um, so coming up like through the ranks, I was like, oh, like here's like a skinny, like lanky, flexible, like American dude. He's like similar body type to me. And uh, I would like watch a lot of his passing game. I like really liked his passing game a lot. Um, but then I, then I would try the Henzo's and uh, I would just get put into leg lock situations all the time. And I'd be like, oh man, I don't know about this. It's either I suck or Keenan just exposes his legs too much. Um, which he actually does. He just like makes things happen off of it. He like lets people enter into his legs and he goes in for back takes and stuff. Um, but Keenan was like the big thing for me coming up. I always like to watch Keenan and of course Gary, cause Gary was, uh, Gary was always really exciting and dynamic to watch. And he used to just beat me up every day. So I'm like, <laughs> well, Gary's good. Um, but then once, uh, once, once I met John and I really started listening to the things that John was telling me and everything started to click. Um, I really, I watch tape, like things that John sends me or if I, I'm watching a match, like a new match happens in the big match, you know, Hodger versus Bouchet or something like that. I'll always watch and study a match, but, um, you know, most of the stuff is just me listening to whatever John says. <laughs> Since we're talking about inspiration and, uh, and getting excited to train, who, who for you is the GOAT, the greatest of all time? If you had to pick one. Uh, as fall. far as submission, grappling and jiu-jitsu, it's definitely Hodger. Um, for someone to be able to take a layoff like he did, I don't know, was it five years? How, how long was he? Yeah, more than. Yeah. Longer. Yeah, yeah longer. I think it was actually, let me see, they, they fought in 2017. Uh, I think it was seven. Yeah, so, you know, anyone who could take off that much time from competing and then come back and to beat the current guy who everyone, like, pretty much unanimously thinks that is the best guy, for him to take off that much time and come back and submit Bouchesha in, you know, under 10 minutes is... Uh, that solidified him for me as the greatest of all time, uh, hands down. Uh, it doesn't matter how many titles everybody else has. Like Hodger went out, and Hodger didn't just beat people. He like went out and submitted everybody. Um, and that's what that's what jujitsu is. It's control that leads to submission. And that was a you know he has a perfect example of that. He went out, he submitted everybody, took a layoff, and then came back and beat the best guy. Like he's he's the greatest of all time for me. Yeah, it was it was. Uh five years in between his his two matches with Almeida he had he had one match in 2015 it was a uh, super fight uh, against Comprido but he fought uh, Bouchesha in 2012 at Meta Morris and then came back and had the rematch um, yeah. 2017 so, and then immediately retired which is a shame because everybody yeah. loved Roger so but yeah that's for me that's that's he's the goat of grappling and and George is the is the goat of MMA because George did the same thing he came back after a five-year layoff and finished the guy a division up for the title so. the champion yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's incredible what about uh what about we talked about short-term goals adcc is in the near future um i'm sure you have 
many events in between now and then. Um, one short-term goal uh, is is absolutely to to continue to succeed in submission grappling. Opportunities between now and then, one that was recently announced. On the weekend, we made the announcement that Kasai Pro 5 is coming up in April, and they announced a £205 tournament. Now, they announced a couple of names for it, including Craig Jones and the participation of Flippy Penner. Yes. Now, I know that Flippy is a man that you have, well, two matches history yes. with. Yes. Uh, is that something you'd be interested in? Because that drop down to 205 right now, you're yes. like 220. Yeah. So, uh, so there's a couple of variables that I have to uh, have to think about. One is I have to make sure I don't need surgery on my knee. Right. Um, so that would definitely make it so I couldn't have a match. Um, and two is uh, it's just so out of place because April is supposed to be like, like for bodybuilders, April is supposed to be like my off season mm. where I'm supposed to gain weight to go to start going up to do a cut for ADCC. So I'm supposed to use March, April, May, June to be heavier and then start cutting down for ADCC if I decide to do, even if I do a, the heaviest division, I'm still gonna be light. Um, so in, in April, I'm supposed to be like 240, 245 pounds. Damn. Um, so that goes against my plans of what I'm supposed to be doing for a, you know, a longer term goal, which is, which is ADCC. Um, so I have to decide. I know I'm gonna fight Felipe eventually. Um, Again, we there has to be a third match, uh, especially if I keep winning. I mean, he doesn't really have he doesn't have to fight me if he doesn't want to. But if I keep winning, I think it's the match to make. Um, I mean, it, like the kind of you can imagine what his response would be, right? It's much like Galvao said a while ago. It's like if you want a shot, then you got to win the ADCC absolute, and it's the ADCC super fight two years later. But yeah, if but that, Felipe's not like that. Felipe's game, like you think so? Yeah, I mean, he's a, he's a really cool dude and. You know, he's like one of the guys who will legitimately compete against me in any rule set. He's a gamer. You know, as long as you, as long as you show up, and as long as you give him, you know, the money that he's asking for, which isn't even a ridiculous amount. Most of the time, it's pretty reasonable. Um, he'll definitely compete. He's um, not one of those guys who's looking for excuses. No, yeah, he he he's very prideful, and he wants to compete against the best guys, just like I do. Um, he isn't not as active as me, and he doesn't have to be because he won world, he won ADCC, he's the ADCC champion. Um, he doesn't have to be as active if he doesn't want to, but uh, he's definitely he's a gamer. He'll go out and compete. Um, the just question for me is, uh, is is it gonna f is it well if it's gonna interfere with my ADCC prep, um, I probably won't do it just because not because I'm you know, I want to fight Felipe obviously, but I know we're gonna have a match eventually, and right now uh, you know ADCC absolute is my main my main goal, especially because I think that Felipe is gonna pretty easily win a match against Galval um, as far as he's just a better grappler on the ground. I think Galval's chance really is just in the standing position, um, but I think Felipe will win, win that match pretty easily. Um, and ADCC is my main goal. The absolute is my main goal. And then eventually, I know we're going to fight in the app, in the in the super fight for ADCC, we'll, which will be huge. Um, so uh, it depends on how my knee is number one, and uh, it depends on how my off season goes and how heavy I will be by then. It's amazing that you're thinking this far out about how the kind of the, the year is going to look in terms of your prep for ADCC. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the whole I mean, the ADCC year is ADCC year. We start the camp start uh start pretty early like last time it was a 12-week camp so uh it was, wow. it was pretty long um but yeah the whole thing for me is uh and the weight cut's not hard right now like i'm only 225 i can get down to 205 pretty easily but i'm supposed to be going it's the wrong way i'm supposed to be going up and then it's gonna be up down up down up down so um we'll see i i mean i know they definitely want me to do it i know it'll be like the most watched match of all time probably but uh we'll we'll see I know for our perspective as well, it's like, we're, you know, we, we want to see that happen. The fans yeah. want to see that happen. It's the one match that everybody mentions all the time, I right? Know. I know it's going to happen eventually. It's just, is it going to interfere with ADCC prep is, is, the, is the question. Of course, so, yeah. It's going to happen eventually. So. The only thing I'm worried about is, man, how many chances are we going to get to see it, right? <laughs> I know. It's like, I know. are we going to look, you know, are you going to go off to MMA? And it's like, yeah. damn, you know. I know. Well, even if I start fighting MMA, I'm still going to, that's the, that's the one match I have to win. You come back yeah, that That'll one. go on the yeah, contract, that's, right? that's like That's like <laughs> that's like the hater's last hope is like Felipe Pena. That's like yeah, the only right. thing they can say. Um, even though, like, everyone loses, like, like Yuri beat Felipe, everyone's like, oh, well, he, you know, Felipe is just the best because he beat Gordon. Um, <laughs> everyone like bases my whole career off that off those two matches. Um, but you know, it is what it is. Um, but yeah, it's a match that has to happen uh, again eventually, especially if I if I keep beating everybody and you know Felipe keeps beating everybody. I think like um, me and Bouchesha and me and me and Felipe are like the two biggest matches to make right now. So are those are the two matches that you you're eyeing the most. Is there anybody else specifically that you would love to crack at? 
Uh, I mean, Lovato is definitely always a good option. I know he's very uh, he's very deep in into MMA and busy with MMA right now. He's you know supposed to fight for the title for Bellator, so that's that's a big uh, a big task. And you know, preparing for a match with me is also a big task. So you know, I see how he's kind of in a dilemma of you know, do I do a camp for MMA or do I do a camp for Gordon? Um, so that's definitely an issue for him, and you know, understand. What is it about Lovato that you would? Why would you want that match? Uh, just because he's one of the most accomplished American grapplers of all time, most accomplished grappler, one of the most accomplished grapplers of all time, um, and uh, he's relatively the same size as me, and uh, he's just one of those guys that I would like to compete against, like to get under my belt as a win. Um, and you know, any other guys who are who are big, any of the guys I lost to, um, you know, low, I would love to compete against again, Vinny, even the guys who I haven't submitted. Um, you know, I had a really close match with Lucas Barboza. You know, he's always you know tough in game. I'd like to compete against him again. Um, you know, I want to compete against everybody. I want to beat everybody. I want to submit everybody, um, just like Hodger did. I want to go out into ADCC and I want to double gold with 100% submission rate. So that's that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> In your estimation, do you think no gi grappling is outpacing gi grappling as far as, as popularity and expansion? Is is there a more, bigger interest there right now? Um, in terms of viewership, yes. Um, I feel like uh, I feel like people people enjoy no gi grappling more. And I think it's I think it's a lot because of the rule set. I think like if you if you take a, a normal person who doesn't know anything about jujitsu and you have them watch a ten minute IBJJF match or you have versus watching a ten minute EBI match, I think everyone's going to agree that the that the EBI match is more exciting. Do you have guys that j are joining your gym just to train for ADCC? Do you have, are you seeing that at all right now? Um, I think actually Craig is trying to come back. He's trying to get a visa to come to come do ADCC camp with me, uh, to with us. Uh, I think uh, Vinny. Uh, expressed some interest in doing ADCC camp with us, wow. but uh, that's kind of uh, interesting. Both guys yeah. that you've competed against, yeah. But, but Craig, uh, Craig's been at Henzo's a few times, right? Yeah, he's been there for a while. Um, Vinny is like a, it's kind of an issue with the weight classes because he might be in my weight class, um, which will be like kind of I don't know. That doesn't really matter to me. It's just weird for him, I guess, or for everybody else. Um, and uh, so him and Craig have both expressed interest in, in doing ADCC camp over uh, here. Craig's trying to get a visa currently. Um, to come train at Henzo's, so you yeah, mentioned as well earlier guys. about the um, the the weight class you haven't decided between under ninety nine or over. But um, would you have a teammate who potentially would be in one or the other? Like you know, um, well, if Nick wins or if Nick or Doug wins trials, then Nick will be over ninety nine and Doug will be under ninety nine. So those guys potentially are in the same weight as me. So I remember, um, for example, Jake got invited last time as well, right? He yeah, did under ninety nine. Yeah. I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get Jake to do a super fight. I think you know Jake is the legend. I think that Jake. Uh, Jake could definitely make an exciting super fight for a DCC. So, I think if he like put him, him against Chael Sonnen, <laughs> put him like a, yeah, put him like against another MMA guy. I was trying to get him to do BJ. I was trying to get BJ Penn first, but then he just got submitted by Ryan Hall. So I think that's like less exciting now. Um, but uh, you know, I think that you know he's he fought for the UFC title. He won pretty much every title there is to win, and he has an extremely uh, impressive grappling record as well. So I think uh, you know I think you know forty. 40 year old Jake Shields deserves a, deserves a super fight. Speaking of Ryan Hall, actually, we had a, a comment come in earlier asking what's your opinion on Ryan Hall? Uh, definitely tough. You know, one of the one of the first leg lockers in the sport, um, you know, definitely paved the way for, you know, some of the early leg locks. Uh, doing pretty well in MMA. Um, has some interesting uh, roles that he does. They're like, uh, they're not MNR roles, they're like modified MNR roles. He stands like a different stance and reaches with the opposite hand. Um, so, you know, definitely interesting. He was uh, he was pretty tough when he was competing. Uh, would love to see if he ever chooses to do jiu-jitsu again, one of our guys compete against him. You know, he was always, uh, he was always you know, in the in the debate for one of the top level leg lockers. So we uh, we hear it a lot from 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 fans and followers that they that they say they would like to see Nikki go up against Ryan. Do you yeah. think that's a good match? Yeah, I think it's a good match. I think uh, I think it's a good match for Nikki. I think that Nikki. Um, I think that Nikki will beat Ryan on the leg on the leg lock exchanges, um, and I think that Nikki. Uh, I think that Nikki is just better all around grappling. I think if Ryan chooses to engage with him in the legs, he's either going to leg locked or Nikki will probably take his back. Um, it's always a question of physicality. I mean, he's a you know grown man. He's been doing jiu jitsu for twenty years, but I think that uh, I think that from a technical standpoint, uh, Nikki Nikki wins that match. Speaking of uh, speaking of Nikki, you you mentioned a few times the. Basically, if Nikki was your size, he'd kick your ass. Is that right? Um, it would definitely be a tough match. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's, uh, 
I don't know if he would beat me up if he was my size, but it would definitely be definitely be a lot more competitive than it is now. I mean, it's still competitive now. Um, <laughs> really? I'll spend like, yeah, because his whole thing, his whole game is based on inside position, so it's hard to put pressure on him. So you go to smash past him, and you can't get any upper body position. You go to Toriando, and he just inverts into your legs. So it's like you try to get past his guard, and it's difficult. Like once you actually do, once I actually do get a hold of him, like I mount him or something, then it's like a little bit easier because he's just so small compared to me. Um, but uh, it would definitely be like once he starts to like actually grow up and like be like an adult it's going to be it's going to be a problem for a lot of people <laughs> it's our our team member reed who's actually uh he's in uh california right now he um, trained with him last time right when he, he did was, uh, well, he, yeah. he said, and it he was said a that rough Nikki experience beat him up worse than anybody <laughs> yeah, yeah i'm telling you man like people people sleep on nikki like nikki nikki hangs with and beats up like a lot of world-class black belts like it's it's no easy it's no easy day training with nikki no matter who you are wow what do you what do you think the future holds for nikki i mean obviously he's got adcc trials next weekend which i'm for sure i'm excited to see um assuming he qualifies and he goes to adcc this uh, later this year do you uh what kind of shot do you think he has realistically um so you know there's always technically i think he's on par or better than the guys that are there um, the question is just physicality. Like he's a 17-year-old kid going against, you know, guys who have been doing this for you know longer than he's been alive. So the, the question of physicality is always the big thing. Um, you know, it's essentially like it's like a little kid fighting like a grown man. Uh, so you know, it definitely strength and size definitely makes definitely makes a difference. Um, but uh, you know, he can be as good as he wants. He, I don't think he has any interest in fighting mixed martial arts. No. So I think that uh, as far as grappling, he could be the greatest of all time um, if if he chooses to be. Uh, I just wish that he would compete more now. Like when I was like a 17, 18 year old kid, I was like so pissed. And like Tom told me, he's like, well, you know, if you think you're the best, and just go out and beat everybody. So I was just trying to go out and submit everybody. Um, versus Nicky, he doesn't really compete much. And uh, why is that? Uh, he he just he wants to get big matches now because he's beaten some big guys. Yeah, he has. Um, which, you know, he definitely deserves big matches, but I think that um, just for long-term goals, I think as a young athlete, it's best to compete as much as you can coming up to the ranks. So you don't have to learn the nuances of competing at high, at, learn the nuances of competing against high-level guys. Like that was Eddie's biggest problem is he didn't compete too often. So he was trying to learn the ins and out, uh, the, in, the ins and outs of, of the tactical side of competing, but he had to do it against guys like like uh, like like Tankino, um or Tokino, whichever one. Tankino, uh, yeah, yeah. Tankino, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, you know that's that's a big a big deal. Like uh, you know going out and learning the tactical side of competing, even just getting used to competing, like the lights and the the crowd and stuff. Um, so people would also say that now is the time for him to go out there and make those mistakes. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Stage in his career when you know the, this this so by the less, time right? but, but, so that by the time you're a black belt, you get all those mistakes out of the way. Mm -hmm. And when the matches, I mean, the matches do count now for him because there's so much steam behind our team and behind you know he's my brother and he definitely has you know big shoes to fill. Um, but you know he's 17 is a purple belt. Yeah. No one's gonna care if he goes out and he loses by a couple of points. Like yeah. those are like now is the time to make the mistakes so that when you actually have matches that matter when you're fighting for money when you're fighting for world titles you don't make those mistakes anymore. So if there's one criticism of Nikki, I and mean, it's not many, but it's just I wish he would compete more. But you know, he has the ability to be the greatest of all time, in my opinion. Is that something you could uh, you can help with? Give him a nudge, or <laughs> I try. I tell him all the time. I like freak out on him. If you saw like our watch our, our WhatsApp messages, it's just like me freaking out on him. I'm like, why don't you compete? Why don't you do this? And he's like, he's like, I just want to compete against big names. I'm like, no one cares about you. You're a purple belt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, I mean, Gordon, this has been absolutely fascinating. I gotta say, it's been really interesting to get your perspective you. on absolutely. so many different topics here so far today. And uh, so, the rest of the afternoon, we'll be uh, we'll be hitting the studio and we'll be recording some match breakdowns and yeah. some. Techniques you guys are gonna love match breakdowns. I'm excited for those. Well, we actually had some people saying that uh, that that you would be a great commentator. So. Oh yeah, I mean. I think I could too, I, minus all the Japanese terminology that nobody knows about. Um, but uh, I would try to, to simplify it for everybody. Um, but yeah, the match breakdowns are going to be good. I think you guys are really going to like those. Like I said, you should be able to watch a match and know exactly what's going on, exactly why something works versus something fails. So I think it's going to be really good um, to go over some of the some of my matches with the with you guys. Awesome. Well, Gordon, it's been a pleasure. Thanks Absolutely. very much. Thank you. Guys, back to our thanks, regularly scheduled programming sooner thanks, rather than later. Uh, thanks very much. See you again.